I just want to say a, a couple of things in terms of introduction. I've known, I mean, as, as so many of you here, uh, Julian's work for decades, in fact, uh, and I've been absolutely always so uh, moved, shocked, surprised, uh, dumbfounded sometimes by the power uh, that resonates in so many of these paintings. And I think the, the exhibition today at Almeet demonstrates this to a new, on a new dimension. Uh, I don't need to mention the, the, the central room behind this wall, which uh, Thomas, in fact, was coming back from London yesterday, and he, if I may put you on the spot and just quote the word that you uh, mentioned, which I think is so perfect, you said, we feel like we're in a cathedral. And, and I think that's, that's very, very true. I, I've also known this great gallery many, on many occasions, and I think your work here brings in a, a dimension that I, I would call transcendent, to resonate with this uh, spiritual situation, this and I don't know whether you want to say a word about this, or whether this is something that you agree with or, or disagree with, perhaps. Well, um, I've always liked to show paintings in irregular kind of spaces, um, and I actually made an exhibition in the Quartel del Carmen in 1989 in Sevilla. Uh, and it was a monastery from 1492 that had been abandoned in the 20th century, taken over by the army and then abandoned in the 50s. And when I went there, it was sort of a wreck. Mm -hmm. But the Junta of Andalusia let me hang my paintings. So I made 24 stations of the cross that you could walk through the Via Dolorosa in this old building. And I thought it was nice that people that lived in that town could see paintings where they lived in a building they passed many times, mm -hmm. uh, and then actually go inside and see something else in there. Uh, so I've kind of made exhibitions in places like, I mean, there was a church in there, and uh, there have been places where that I'm drawn to that look like cathedrals. Yeah. So I guess a painting studio is like that. I think it's also very nice to see the paintings in a white room, because mm -hmm. I don't live in a house with a white room. <laughs> and all these paintings were painted outside, so yeah. I didn't even see them inside mm. until recently. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and the, obviously the paintings in the other room are from 20, well, the, the, the one painting, from, the, the purple ones are from 25 years ago, and the uh, virtue paintings from 1986. 86. The two paintings in the other room I made, one in, in, the, um, in the winter in Mexico, and the other one in the summer in New York. Uh, but basically, I work outside, so wherever I go, whether it's the winter or the summer, I try to find the summer everywhere.
and that's a, that's a dimension that you, you, I know most of you are in, in, intimately familiar with Julian's work, many of you collect his work, and so you're probably not being surprised by hearing uh, Julian say that, but this is a dimension of his work that is not, I would say, often acknowledged. Uh, the fact that not only you work outside, uh, but I, actually you showed me recently on your iPhone a, an image of how uh, Julian works. And, and I, as you probably know, Julian is very insistent on uh, people, critics, curators, collectors, dealers, not create, assess their judgments, their, their vision of his work, based purely on reproductions. That's true of most artists, you might say, but in the case of Julian, there's really, really a very, very strong reason why that is so important. You heard, he paints outdoors. That's a tradition that starts, broadly speaking, with the Impressionists, before the Impressionists, you might say, but in the case of a 21st century artist like Julian, it takes yet again another dimension. And so I'm going to try to reconstruct for your uh, visual imagination of how, how it, it, it happens. You have trees, basically, right? And you hang, uh, usually it's three canvases, isn't it? Or more? Uh, uh, I mean, you don't want to take us there because it's, it's absolutely a fascinating uh, installation that you set well, I just up. think it's important to be able to see when you're working. Mm -hmm. And you can see better outside than inside. Paint, paint outside invariably, invariably will look better inside. You can make paintings inside, they don't always look better outside. Mm -hmm. It's like a woman putting on their makeup in a room that's really crummy with bad lighting. They walk out of the room, their cheeks are purple, their lips are the wrong color, and they wonder, how come I look so crummy? Well, go outside and put your makeup on. Them. You can see better. Uh, and when you are working outside, you can use materials that maybe, you, you know, I can use a hose. I use a hose a lot to wash uh, the paint. These particular paintings, I had made marks on them with a, a rag that was dipped in uh, uh, ink, and then later I wanted it to bleed, so I used a hose to make it bleed. And then the hose uh, or the, the wet paint finds some other place, the floor of the studio, uh, and other paintings get created out of that, but what he's talking about is there were, um, uh, I have a place in Mexico and uh, instead of stretching them on a stretcher, I, I, I uh, stapled the, the material to a pole on the top and bottom and then tied the poles between the palm trees near my house so I could see through the painting. And so the two reverse paintings that are in the other room are made by, I was painting on one side and using spray paint. And I noticed that the spray paint, when I would spray on one side, came through in a way that was very unusual to spray paint. And you ended up with a space in between. So they look kind of like tubes rather than solid marks. And I'm always interested in trying to make different kinds of marks or different kinds of images because you can have the same intention, but it can manifest itself in a lot of different appearances. And so, going back to, to the paintings, the two paintings that are in the back here, and uh, if you are interested, if I may say so, there are also two, two more in the, the offices yes. that are uh, made out of this process. I'd just like to, you to, to imagine what was going on. I mean, uh, as I'm quoting uh, Julian, in fact, you will find that we, we, we did an interview together which uh, Ami will publish uh, soon, and which Julian expands on this. But basically, what happened, if I understand correctly, is that you were doing, you were spraying those those paintings with a hose, as you, you mentioned, and, and because you with have spray paint, actually, with, the hose. with spray paint, and because you were in, in, in capable, <laughs> sorry, capable of seeing the other side, because they were hanging, you discovered that on the other side there was a whole other situation coming out, and that this particular composition, the reverse composition that you, in a sense, have not really controlled to begin with, right. became of greater interest to you, and you decided to use that instead of the, uh, of the recto painting, correct? Yeah, it's, it's less predictable, and it's nice when you can surprise yourself. Mm -hmm. And you seem to have an intention that makes you start, but it's not necessarily where you're going to arrive, and hopefully, 
as you're in the process of doing that, you'll do something that you can surprise you yourself. Which is making the point. That that notion of intending to do something and letting the process take over and take you by surprise, as you've heard Julian mentioned several times, is I think really essential to uh, to the practice that you see in, 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 in Julian throughout. Peter Grant, who was sitting over there, was telling me something really interesting earlier on. He, he was saying uh, Julian reinvented the language of uh, uh, les objets trouvés, the found objects, you know, the Duchamp situation. I think that's so, so true. So many artists have been impacted by Duchamp's concept of the objet trouvé. Julian, to a degree, starts with his base, but does not, I would say, doesn't take a lazy approach to the objet trouvé. You can't wait for the objet trouvé, just let them be there for your contemplation. Julian intervenes on top of this, transforms it, decides to add on to this, and is not a prisoner of that kind of uh, model, if that makes any sense. Uh, and I think that all the works that you see here are a little bit this, uh, the result of this really interesting intercross between uh, found procedure, chance, attitude, and yet, you know, those marks, those, the, the, the additions, the subtractions, you know, you look sometimes, Julian just decides to carve out, you know, this whole thing here was, was a part of the landscape. That, let's, let's start maybe telling you about these, these incredible paintings. Um, maybe I'm speaking too much, but I'm, I'm going to let one person say a few words. You have, Ju I mean, puts there two texts, Forget mine, but look at the one which I absolutely adore by Sai. Sai Schnabel. Well, Julian has, among other things, great songs. One of them I see over there, Vito. And I just want to quote this great, uh, great sentence, if you don't mind. The goat is standing on a cliff. The landscape is hilly, with the river exiting into the ocean. The river penetrating right through the middle of the Greenland mass. That's what it was, as simple as that. This began as a, a wallpaper that Stella gave. And this was a deformed wallpaper, uh, and it was a scene of Cornwallis giving the sword to George Washington. Uh, and then, uh, so there are men on the bottom of these paintings, of uh, uh, the wallpaper. And uh, when Mike Kelly died, uh, I wanted to make a painting for him. And so I had a goat in my studio that Stella gave me also for about 20 years with a rabbit on top of his head. And so Mike liked stuffed animals and made a lot of work with stuffed animals. And I thought, you know, I thought he was a great artist and it was sad that he committed suicide. Uh, anyway, I made the first painting and actually said goodbye Mike Kelly on it. Uh, the soldiers were in it. And as I worked on uh, these paintings, I started to take uh, the, I took the figures out, and um, where the mountains are, um, I just sort of, I messed with the image a bit and made a, um, the mirror image of the mountain so it seemed like it was water. Mm -hmm. And then uh, changed the plinth that the, rat, that the uh, goat was on. But um, if you look at the way that, uh, I mean, Defoe wallpaper is French wallpaper, but it was very influenced by Japanese woodcuts. Roman, you want to see it up here? If you look at the shorthand on the way the things are, are uh, the French wallpaper was uh, constructed, and you look at the way, say, the uh, imprint of the rag makes a similar kind of drawing, you realize that there's all sorts of shorthand and ways of putting paint on. I think probably one of my main interests is trying to make a painting. How do you make a painting? How do you draw? How do you make a larger mark? Um, and um, I have no hierarchical notions of uh, what is uh, more important, or whether it's a word that's on a painting, or uh, what material it's made out of, or the kind of paint that's used. So there's a kind of equanimity about about, uh, it's funny, I'm having a deja vu here. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so, uh, actually, what Sai 
what Cy wrote. So, what Cy wrote. Okay, I, I have uh, six children. Um, Vito is the oldest son, but I have twin boys, and Cy, his little brother, um, never said a word to me about painting, ever. <laughs> and he was 19 years old, and he came in, he was looking at one of these goat paintings. I can read this very quickly, because mm -hmm. he's a good writer. It's cool. it's cool. He wrote, Dad's goat paintings and its resemblance. The garments on the goat, the scarf, the bead necklace, they're familiar, why? He was wearing them. This is he in a past life. Where does it come from? A dream or a similar experience? Who knows? What is it that brings a sense of familiarity? I don't think it's the goat's physical appearance, but at the same time it is. The goat is standing on a cliff. The landscape is hilly, with the river exiting into the ocean. The river penetrating right through the middle of the green landmass. That's what it was, as simple as that. Now that he looks in retrospect at his past life, he wants something more to complement him, to accompany him in that moment. His emotions in his present life intertwine with his past life as a goat, years before he was born. He's in love. He wants to pollute the sky with purple. There's so many clouds and then pink dots, the sunset's reflection on time itself. Abstraction is hard to dissect, but once it's fully interpreted, it's as symbolic and as satisfying as can be. You've created an opinion like the artist. All that deep thinking subsequently treats you with joy. You deserve it. If his only recollection of his past life were through a dream, then he wouldn't be able to travel back and forth between the present and the past. These paintings serve as a time capsule. Most dreams are just a cloud of confusion, your stream of consciousness mixed with anxiety and excitement. Most people don't know how to make use of this. He does. Out of all the, spontane out of all the spontane spontaneity of thought, and beyond thought that, come, that comes to him and from him, this one was precisely ingrained in him, and with that reason they materialize and become the thing. He never said a word of pain, about painting before that or after that. <laughs> but he gave me that when he was 19. Gorgeous text, gorgeous text. And he, and he said it if I could take some of these expressions, because these guys, I will not only does, I think, Julian and what, these wonderful kids who, uh, I really believe so, uh, but they, they really, uh, your, your kids do understand your work in a way. Can I steal ideas from them? <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that expression that you heard, abstraction, hard to dissect. These are the words by Sai Schnabel. I just love it. And, and you just said something which I also find very interesting, which is that, uh, and it's one of the reasons, by the way, I, I personally believe why some uh, unfortunate, perhaps, colleagues of mine have taken so long to reconcile themselves and to come to grips with uh, the fact that you are definitely uh, one of the, if not the leading artists of your generation. Peter was rightly say, reminding me that in the uh, 1980s, there was only uh, Julian Schnabel, one of the painting, actually, by the way, the painting of 1986 that uh, Julian was mentioning, which is Virtue, was in the, in the Whitney Biennial in 1987. T just to give you a small token of uh, what was going on. Yes, so you could not avoid Julian Schnabel. He was this absolute master for, for, for this younger generation and older generation. But the, the curators of the Inap had some kind of resistance. And, couldn't. and the reason, I believe, is because what you're doing is that you are not allowing yourself, you are transcending again all the categories that curators like to find. You know, he is a conceptual artist, he's a post conceptual artist. He's a figurative artist, he's an abstract artist, he's a painter, he's a filmmaker, and all of these things are true of, of Julian. He masters all these techniques and manages to establish bridges, connections within those different fields, media, techniques, etc., that I think nobody has ever done, frankly. I mean, the, 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 the spray paintings that you see behind, this notion that you, you start painting, I, mean, I think it's so brilliant, so intelligent, and and uh, audacious and, and crazy in a sense. You start painting a painting and you discover, oh, the marks on the back are more interesting than what I'm doing. Oh, I'm going to take that and, and, and to start as a, as a base. I think that's, to me, um, and I want to say one, more, one final thing which we could begin to conclude perhaps on this, this notion, side schnabel again, you deserve it, Julia. You deserve every success of yours. You deserve this magnificent show. 
you deserve what Peter was just telling me, and Mayo Museum, the MoMA, has just acquired, finally, San Sebastian. You know, um, that is a fantastic piece of news. And I think it's, it's and, and I really feel there's a momentum, which, which I mean is, is, is really building up, help, helping to gather this, this force that is manifesting itself around uh, entirely, I mean, not only in this country, but in America and in everywhere, that you are truly uh, finally beginning to be given the recognition that you uh, were deserving size work, uh, words for, for too, too long, you know, in a sense. And I think this is going to be the beginning of a process that we're going to see over and over. I really profoundly see so that. I hope you agree. Well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, I think it's, I'm, I'm extremely happy to have this show here. We don't have to sit around here anymore and talk about any of this. Uh, but, you know, Bernard and I have been friends for over 30 years, and uh, 30 years ago, uh, he bought a group of paintings from me, and uh, uh, has always been supportive, and we kind of, you know, it's funny how you come in and out of contact with people sometimes, but it was a real bond, and he was actually with me in Nîmes. I don't know how many people in this room have seen the paintings that were in Nîmes, but I made uh, three 22-foot square paintings for the Maison Carré that were there for four years. And it was interesting to see that, because, um, Anyway, we were there together. My father was alive at the time, and he drove my father around the sports car. And my father thought it was the coolest thing ever. But uh, we were um, standing there, and I, Marty Scorsese's movie, uh, The Goodfellas, came out exactly at that time, the night before I was in Paris watching The Goodfellas, which is, I think, a really great movie. And um, then I went to Nîmes, and I was standing in the Maison Carré, which is a Roman temple that Caesar built for his daughter. And there wasn't anybody in that room except me. But that was the ecstasy that I had chosen. That's what I wanted to do. I was super happy about seeing those paintings in that place. Mm -hmm. And so it's very satisfying for an artist when, and obviously you need the support of other people in order to have a place to show paintings. But uh, I'm really happy with the paintings that are here and the privilege to show them here. And uh, so I guess we should just look at them. And I think and one nice thing about this space is actually as the light gets darker, the paintings get more intense in here and the walls become wider. And I'm usually not a big fan of white walls, but you know, I think it's a good clinical, uh, surgical way to look at the paintings and judge them and see what you get out of them. I don't know, does anybody have a question or would like to say anything? No, I don't have a question. And the images are found, found, found images, but do you print them in such a format? Yeah, I, um, the, I, I, I printed the wallpaper and superimposed the goat, which is yeah. a physical a goat that I had. Uh, a photograph of the goat into the landscape. And that was a blank canvas, and then started from there. Yeah. So, so you, you might say that this is in a way a collage of found objects yeah, yeah. to begin well, with. Yeah, but it was re reproduced by you. Yeah. Yeah. Put together. They're just reproductions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? And the paint you use is what you Actually, use? the purple. Uh, is is ink? It's a, it's an ink that's part shellac, yeah. uh, and the pink is oil paint. Hmm. I think that if you look, you, you see the the oil. Yeah, the oil. Yeah. The, this is the oil. And, and to make those pink dots, I actually have a brush that's taped to a big stick, so I could kind of get back. And go, okay, I think I need a dot over there. Hmm. I think I think I need a dot over there, and um, so quick way of painting dots, instead of crawling up on a ladder each time and then getting back and wondering about it. So there's a, you know, you find a tool for each thing. There's sort of a method to the madness, and then there isn't. Peter? These pictures are very reminiscent of earlier important 
paintings that you did, uh, the Kabuki series of paintings, right there. Yeah, you know, um, there was a line in the film Basquiat where um, I thought that the thing about New York is you could always, if you go away, you could always come back and start over with somebody else. And I think um, after Joseph Boys died, also, I mean, there's a, the, the Chinese calligraphers used to change their name mid-career so they could start over with somebody else. So isn't it a wonderful thing if you could actually make something that has a totally different appearance that could be yours also? Uh, and instead of repeating and signaturizing, making the same thing over and over, because that's what you did before, to have a reprieve from that and find something new. So invariably what would happen to me is I would work on things and as people would see what I was doing, they'd say, ah, he might like that. So there was a guy who I lent my studio to on 23rd Street, and he didn't have any money, but he was walking by the UFC gym, and they had thrown out the boxing ring that Mike Tyson was training on. And so he brought three pieces of material to me that were, had gaffer's tape on them and blood from the, and sweat from the boxers, and they had a great patina to it. I made some paintings. One of them was called Edge of Victory. Um, and, um, and again, invariably, people would see, oh, that looks like a Schnabel painting. So I, I was, uh, I, I, I just came back from Japan. The man was Chinese, Japanese. He said, I, I, ha I can get you uh, the backdrops from the Kabuki Theater. Would you want to paint on them? I said, of course, yeah, absolutely. So um, he brought me, I, I guess I made about 13 paintings uh, that were painted by a Japanese sign painter for the Kabuki Theater, and then I just would respond to those things, add what I thought should be added, or, um, so I, that was in 1986, I think. Um, and these paintings, yeah, they definitely relate to those. And I remember somebody saying, oh, that guy just defaced those cultural Japanese uh, folkloric uh, um, objects, and." I thought, well, if you go somewhere and you don't bring anything back with you, why'd you go? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, anything else? Yeah, I like this painting very much, Julian, really. And I like that, uh, that violet mist. I just wonder whether your pajama is purposely matching this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just, I, I was a little off. I really tried, but I couldn't get it closer. I came, even though I couldn't match it perfectly. I think you're close enough, truly. <laughs> and so, you know, I did, I did uh, make a couple of movies in my life. And uh, one of the reasons why I actually thought I could even make a movie was when I was a teenager. I went to the Kingsway Theater and I saw a movie called Repulsion that Roman Polanski made. I had no idea, first of all, I had never seen a movie like that. <laughs> and I had never had any idea that, that there were movies like that because it was a, you know, is that your phone, Roman? No. Yes. Okay. So, no, no. Uh, okay. So it was, uh, Turn it off. it's a manual, right? So I was, uh, I didn't know. That was a, this great surprise. And, um, I didn't know I was going to make movies also, so it was a beautiful thing. And it's one of those great things that if you live long enough, you meet different people whose work you love, and, and that if they have respect for you, don't think you're a total degenerate you know, parasite who's just ripping them off or whatever, they might actually take you to dinner once in a while. <laughs> and so when I was making The Diving Bell and the Butterfly uh, with Emmanuel, and um, there's a few people in this room who were in the movie with me. We all did that together, but he was very, very nice to me. And when I made this film, Miral, about a Palestinian girl uh, uh, living in East Jerusalem in an orphanage, they, there's a scene in a, in a night, in a, in a, a scene in a cinema, and actually the movie that was playing was a John Wayne film. And I definitely didn't want to have that in the movie. And 
Roman let me use repulsion, so all these people ran in and get blown up in a movie while they're all watching a guy trying to get in this room who was basically in the demented mind of Catherine Deneuve. But anyway, merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you for lending me your paintings for my picture, uh, the Ghost Writer. You know, I wanted to say something about that also, because uh, uh, I was thinking about that today. Uh, a couple of years ago, Rowan made a movie called Ghost Writer, and he asked if he could borrow some paintings for the interior of some of the scene. And so they were reproductions, they were printed like this, except there wasn't paint on them. They were, sent to, uh, where did you shoot that? It was in north of Germany on the coast. He created Cape Cod. Benemunde. He created Cape Cod in the north of Germany. <laughs> uh, good job, too. Anyway, uh, so I received one of those printed things back about two years ago. And it's been lying around, this piece of material was lying around out in Montauk. And I was getting ready to come back from the garden to the house, and this thing, I just stretched it just like that. And I thought, as I was passing it, you know, I think it needs a little bit of black. And I sprayed something on it, and I said, well, you know, I, I, think, I think it could use a little pink. And I did something else to it, and after about 25 minutes, I had a painting that I was extremely happy with. Now, it took me two years of it sitting in the dirt, lying around, me, me not paying attention to it, but what I just want to say is that in about 15 minutes, you could, as a painter, yeah. you could do something in your backyard and go back into your house and think that you earned your day's food or whatever it is, and you actually can feel that's one of the things you can do by yourself. And that's an amazing gift that the world of painting can open up for somebody if they can access that thing. Mm -hmm. So thanks for sending it back. And, Thanks for and lending it to me. And, and there's so many people here that I love, actually. You know, it's funny, because I was with Jeff Koons for his 50th birthday. And he was at Jeffrey Deitch's uh, birthday party. And he said, I love, there's a lot of people in that room. He said, I love everybody in this room. And I thought, you're out of your fucking mind. <laughs> love everybody in this room? I said, I thought of Marlon Brando in uh, One Eye Jacks, where he says to Carl Molden, in this town, you're one-eyed Jack. I've seen your other side. And I've seen the other side of most of those people, but I do could say that I love a lot of people in this room, and I wouldn't be lying. So uh, thanks for coming, and uh, 